fasten your seatbelts. Next service, or the second half, you'll have to fasten your strap as well. All right, quick question. How old was Abraham when Isaac was born? A hundred. The Torah portion today is toldot. What does toldot mean? Generations, that is exactly right, but it means more than a genealogical list. It means all the family stories that go along with it. <laughs> like you guys have heard of all kinds of stories about your grandpa, your grandma, your sister, your brothers. Well, the word told don't means all of those stories. Now, one thing uh, that I spoke on, I don't know, about a month ago or so, whatever it was, but to me, it's so fascinating how many of you know the word toldot? Can you see the letters? It's like the tod, the T-O-L-D-O-T, uh, toldot. But you know what? It's spelled wrong. God intentionally spelled the word toldot wrong. But again, in the English, we think we know better, so we correct uh, God's misspelling. But it is intentionally misspelled. So I want to show you why. All right, in Genesis 2, 4, it begins with, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth. And if you'll notice, there's a vav in it. Now, what does the vav do? It's a connector, like you have two boards and you nail it. The nail is the vav. That's why the first time it is used is with the word and of heavens and earth. Now, it says... These are the generations, but look at Genesis 5, verse 1. The very next time this word is mentioned, it says, this is the book of the generations of Adam. But what's different? The Vav is gone. And the Vav is gone in this Torah portion as well. It is misspelled the next 70 times in the Old Testament. It's never spelled correctly again. Who remembers why? Who remembers why? Good thing I'm going over it again. Okay, I mean, here, you have this, like, told it to. It's, it's missing it. Here's the reason why. The letter Vav is a connector. The letter Vav is number what? Six. Who was created on the sixth day? Man. Okay, so Vav, there's different levels here. When God made the heavens and the earth, everything was perfect. But what happened here... Adam fell and broke the connection between heaven and earth. So now generations is missing the Messiah. It's missing someone who's going to reconnect heaven back to earth. Do you know when the next time it is spelled correctly? It is spelled correctly in the book of Ruth. Now these are the generations of Peretz. Peretz is so incredible. I'm speaking about him next week. But who comes from Peretz? The verse goes on to say, and Obed beget Jesse, and Jesse beget who? David. David is the missing man who's going to bring forth the Messiah. Now, nobody ever sees this or knows this unless they connect the Hebrew roots. Do you remember in Matthew 1, it says the book of the generation of Yeshua HaMashiach, the son of who? It doesn't say son of Adam. It doesn't say son of Noah. It doesn't say son of Abraham. It's because David is the missing man who's going to connect us back to Yeshua. Now, here's Matthew 1.17 where it talks about that. Look at this. So all the generations from, Avid, from Abraham to David are how many? 14. And from David to the carrying away into Babylon are how many? And from the carrying away into Babylon to the Messiah, how many? Why? Most Christians have no idea what the 14 is about. I'm going to show you. Matthew knew because Matthew was Jewish. And every Jew who read this got it. Okay, what do we see here? The first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Let's say them. What are they? Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalet, He, Vav. There are six letters. And that is number one through six. Okay, so Aleph is one, Beit is two, Gimel is three, Dal is four, Hayes five, and six. Guess what? David, when you add it up, is 14. The Dalit is four, there's two, and the Vav is six. Every time it says 14, 14, 14, the Jew is reading David, David, David. 
they know that the connection is back to David and the son of David who is the Messiah. And he's the man who's connecting heaven and earth again, like Jacob's ladder. He is the ladder. He's the one connecting heaven and earth, and we're going to see that. Let's see. Yeah, there you go. Four, six, and four. Fourteen. All right. With that said, let's go to Genesis 25, 7, which is just before the Torah portion. It says, and these are the days of the years of Abraham's life, which he lived, which was 175. So if Abraham died at 175, how old is Isaac? 75. Okay, now look at Genesis 25, 19 and 20, the beginning of our Torah portion. These are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham beget Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife. The daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Padanaram, the sister to Laban, the Syrian. Okay, so if Isaac is 40 when he married Rebekah, how old is Abraham? 140, right. Now, uh, that's when Isaac marries Rebekah. Isaac is 40 years old. Now let's go to Genesis 25, 26. It says, after that, okay, his brother, came his brother out and his hand took a hold on Esau's heel and his name was called Jacob and Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah bore them. Now, Jacob literally means heel grabber. And he grabbed his heel. So that's why he's called heel grabber. That's what Jacob means. Okay, so how long was Rebekah barren then? If Isaac was, got married at 40 and Isaac was 60, 20 years old. Exactly. That's how long Rebekah was barren for 20 years. Now, how old is Abraham when Jacob and Esau are born? 160. Therefore, they knew grandpa for 15 years. That's how long they knew grandpa, Abraham, 15 years. Now, I want to show you this timeline. Now, oh, we should have a handout for you. I don't know if you can read this, but I made this chart. Isaac's age timeline. Isaac is how old when this happens? Okay. Well, Isaac is born when Abraham is 100, Sarah's 90, Ishmael's 14. Then we see Abraham goes to Abimelech. Abimelech goes to Abraham. Here, Isaac is 40 when he marries Rebekah. He's 60 when Jacob and Esau are born. Abraham dies when Jacob and Esau are 15 years old. On the top is every scripture that you can have to see the uh, timeline. You're going to see Esau is 40 years old when he marries a Canaanite. But here, Shem dies. So Isaac is 110 when Shem dies, and you're going to find that Esau, he has a family. He's been married, and yet he's willing to sell his birthright over food. Jacob and Esau were 50 years old when he sold the birthright. Most people don't realize that. He was 50 years old, and he had a family. Jacob has no family, and he sees the importance of the birthright. We'll go on in a minute. Okay, so here's what I want you to realize. It wasn't until 35 years later when Jacob and Esau were 50 years old that Shem dies. What that means, Shem was on the boat with Noah. Isaac knew Shem for 95 years. He was able to talk about the flood. And you sure, I am sure, uh, uh, Shem told Isaac all about the flood. Well, guess what? Jacob knew Shem for another 35 years. Now look at Genesis 9, 28 and 29. We see Noah lived after the flood 350 years, and all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. Do you know Abraham knew Noah for 58 years? Abraham knew Noah for almost 60 years, hearing firsthand from Noah himself. Now, was Noah, therefore, already living in Israel when Abraham arrived? Remember, God told Abraham, you get up and go into this other country. I believe Noah was already there, and Shem was in Jerusalem. Shem had a Bible university there. And you're going to find out how you 
this is all in the Bible, but there was a university of Shem in Jerusalem. All the time, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were alive. Okay, let's look at Genesis 11, 10, and 11. These are the generations of Shem. Shem was 100 years old when he begat Arphaxad two years after the flood. And then Shem lived after that for 500 more years begetting sons and daughters. So Shem dies at 600 years old, living over 500 years after the flood happened. Well, as you look at these generations, Shem is 390 years old old when Abraham is born. And he outlives Abraham. Shem is 490 years old when Isaac is born, 100 years later. And he's 550 when Jacob and Esau are born. Shem is 565 when Abraham dies. And so Shem even knew Jacob and Esau until they were 50 years old. Now, here we go to Genesis 25, 21 through 23. Isaac entreats the Lord because Rebecca is, uh, can't have a baby because she was barren and the Lord was entreated by him and Rebecca, his wife, conceived. So the children struggled together within her and she said, if it be so, why do I live? And so she went to inquire of the Lord. She went to Jerusalem to talk to Shem. That's where she went. Shem is still alive. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples will be separated from your body. The one people will be stronger than the other, but the elder will serve the younger. One thing I want to mention here that's important. It was Rebecca, not Isaac, who received the word concerning God's choice of Jacob over Esau. It was Eve, not Adam, who received the prophecy concerning her seed. It was Sarah, not Abraham, who correctly discerned God's choice of Isaac over Ishmael. It was Miriam, Yeshua's mother, not Joseph, who receives the angelic word first. Okay. Anyway, just something to be thinking about. Okay. Genesis 25, verse 27 and 28, Jacob and Esau grow. Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field, and Jacob was a plain man. Plain? What does it mean, plain? Well, that could also be translated as he was homely. He was a homely man. It also could be translated as he was a quiet man. But the word in Hebrew is tamay, which means he was full of integrity, full of truth, without blemish, without spot. And we come to Genesis 25, 31 through 33. Jacob says, sell me this day your birthright. And Esau said, behold, I'm about to die anyway. What profit does this birthright do to me? He wasn't even thinking about his offspring he already had. It was all about him. And Jacob said, well, swear to me this day. And he swore to him and he sold his birthright to Jacob. Therefore, Jacob never stole it. He was just trying to make sure he got it and prove that Esau had sold it. He never stole the birthright. Even later at the end, he was just gonna make sure he got what he already bought. He probably never told dad that Esau sold it. Okay, so, now look at this. Genesis 25, 34, Jacob gave Esau what? Bread and lentils, do you see that? Bread and lentils. Well, guess what? For thousands of years, it's been this way. Here is a Jewish funeral guide. And you look, this is the meal of condolence. And what do they serve? Bread and lentils. That tells you when he's doing this, someone has died. When you understand, and what do we see? Let me go back. I'm going to run, oh, uh, well, first, I'm going to break in with this. This is the problem with replacement theology. It turns Yeshua from this into this. And then we wonder why the Jews don't recognize him. How about, can he recognize his baby pictures? Here is his mother and him as a baby. 
Christianity tries to create God in their image rather than realizing we're all created in his image. So this is the problem. And this is why you've got to connect to the Hebraic roots. Look at this. Shem dies and he sells the birthright over food. They were 50 years old. The question is, who's going to get the blessing of the priesthood from Shem? He's Melchizedek. Shem was Melchizedek, in case you didn't know. Shem was Melchizedek. Melchizedek just means king of righteousness. He was also known as the king of Salem, which was Jerusalem. He was the king. Shem was the king in Jerusalem, and it was Shem who was Melchizedek. All right? Now, I hope I didn't shock you all too much yet. Okay, so here, Shem dies when Jacob and Esau are 50. Isaac was how old when they were born? 60. That means Isaac is 110 when Shem dies. Isaac knew his great, 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 great grandpa Shem for 95 years. Now, just as Sarah went to, I don't mean Sarah, I mean Rebecca went to Jerusalem to inquire of the Lord, I believe Isaac right after the Akedah, or Abraham was going to kill him, and then he didn't, he disappears, he went to Jerusalem. And he also learned from Shem. Now, in Genesis 14, 18, and 19, it says Melchizedek, and the title Melchizedek, he was the king of Salem. That's Jerusalem. He brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. So here we have someone who was both priest and king, which is what Israel was supposed to do. But because they worshiped the golden calf, they got separated into two groups. These are the priests, and here's where the king is. Okay, um, let's see. All right, so here's what's about to happen. The kingly priesthood of Melchizedek, or Shem, is about to be passed on. Who wants that? Jacob or Esau? Esau says, forget it. I'll give it to Jacob. Jacob, because he's been to the school of Shem, realizes the importance of this. And let's look at Exodus 19.6. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. These are the words that you are to speak to the children of Israel. Then we see in Genesis 26.34, Esau is how old? 40, so how old is Jacob? 40, they're twins. Okay. He took a wife, Judith, the daughter of Biri, the what? The terrorist. Remember, the Hittite means terrorists. And the daughter of Elon, another Hittite. He marries the Hittites. And they were a bitterness of spirit to Isaac and Rebekah. All right. Now, this happened 10 years before Shem's death. After Shem's death, who was alive at the time to inherit the priesthood? Well, like I said, Esau's perspective was that he's going to die anyway. So to him, it was meaningless, not even considering his offspring. Now, let's jump to Genesis, or go back to Genesis 26, 1 through 5. Look at this. There was a famine in the land, besides the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac goes to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, to Gerar. And the Lord appeared to him. And he says, I don't want you to go down to Egypt like Abraham did. Dwell in the land I'll tell you of. So during this land, I'll be with you. I will bless you. For to you and to your seed, I will give all of these countries. And he says, I will perform the oath that I swore to Abraham, your father, and I will make your seed to multiply as what? This is very important for next week. You have to realize the seed of Israel is to be compared to the stars of heaven. And he says, I will give to your seed all these countries, and in your seed will the nations of the earth be blessed. Okay, now hold on. Moses. How far is Moses from Abraham? How many years separate Abraham and Moses? It's about 500 years, twice as old as the United States. Who gave us the Torah? Moses? Oh, right, but when did it come into print? Moses. But wait, there's more. 
Look at this. It says, because Abraham obeyed my voice, kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my Torah. Abraham followed Torah 500 years before the Torah was given? Yes! Absolutely. The Torah has been from the very, very beginning since Adam. Genesis is in the Torah, and there's no commandments in Genesis. We've got to get out of our mind that Torah just means law. It means instruction and teaching. Abraham was instructed between clean and unclean food. Everyone was instructed they couldn't even eat animals until Noah's day. Okay, so there was all kinds of instruction. When Cain and Abel did the offerings, they couldn't offer unclean food. It had to be clean food. So from the very beginning, they knew they didn't have all of the Torah, but they had Torah or instruction. And now look at Genesis 26, 12 through 15. So Isaac sowed in that land. He reaped the same year a hundred times what he planted. That's why God tells us in Psalms, don't you worry during the times of famine. God's going to take care of you. Now, what happens? The Philistines who lived in Gaza envied him. Now look at this is the most stupidest thing. I mean, stupid is as stupid does. Look at this. It says, so what did the Philistines do who envied him? All the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham, his father, the Philistines had them stopped and filled them with dirt. Here there's a famine and these idiot Philistines fill all the wells with dirt. Because they hate the Jew so much, they so much in spite of, they fill the wells with dirt. Oh, I mean, uh, here, uh, in a famine, you have to water for yourself and get water for your livestock. It's scarce. And this is the Gaza Strip, guys. This is where this is happening. Okay, Genesis 26, 16, and 17. Abimelech says to Isaac, get out of here, for you are much stronger than we are. So Isaac departed from there, and he camped in the valley of Gerar. Remember from my map, Gerar is right next to the Gaza Strip. Now look at Genesis 20, 16. It says, Isaac dug again the wells of water. He, you know, took all the dirt out, which they had dug in the days of Abraham, his father, because the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham. Immediately after the death of Abraham, they fill them. I mean, that is just so stupid. Well, kind of like when they gave the Gaza Strip back to them. What did they do? They had all these farms full of fruit they were selling to Europe. The first thing they did was tear it all down and take the aluminum and the different things they could recycle and sold it for recycling. Okay. Well, I want you to get a load of this. We are to be like Isaac. Our reinvestigation and digging into our ancient roots is much like Isaac's journey going back to the wells of his father. The original sources have been hidden and buried from us. We know the Torah is also likened to a well of water and it also has been hidden from us and filled with dirt. And so we're going back we're undigging all of the mess our fathers have given us and we're going back to the wells of water. <clears throat> That's why there's another verse that says the Gentiles will say we've inherited lies from our fathers. Let's look at Genesis 27.1. It came to pass when Isaac was old, his eyes were dim, so he couldn't see. So he calls Esau his what? It doesn't say his firstborn. He doesn't deserve the title of firstborn. He sold the firstborn right, so he just called his oldest son. And he said to him, my son, and he said to him, behold, here am I. Well, guess what? The physical blindness is a common metaphor for spiritual blindness. Isaac thought Esau was to be preferred, but Sarah knew better. Okay, well, guess what? There's inherited blindness among Israel, both with Isaac and with Jacob. They were both blind, and he couldn't tell Ephraim from Manasseh. Look at Genesis 48, 10. It says, now the eyes of Israel were dim for age, so he could not see. And he brought them near to him, and he kissed them and embraced them. So Isaac was blind, and Jacob was blind. But here, look at this. In Romans eleven twenty five, I would not, brothers, that you be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness has happened where? How much? 
In part. The Jews are only blinded in part. It's happened unto Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. The problem, too, with Christianity, they think fullness means a certain number. It's got nothing to do with number. He's waiting for the maturity of the Gentiles. You don't do a harvest until it's mature. God is waiting for the Gentiles to mature, to grow up, the remnant, okay? A Jew would have to be totally blind to accept a blonde-haired, blue-eyed Messiah who abolishes the Torah and whose followers regularly kill the Jews in his name. Do you remember all those replacement theology pictures I just showed you? And then we wonder why they're so blind? When actually, here we've had the Gospels for 2,000 years, and Christians are still largely blind to Jesus' Jewishness and don't even know his real name was Yeshua. And it's been 2,000 years. Israel is blind, but the church is blind. And the first one to humble themselves and look out of the other lens gets to see the clear picture. And then everything becomes 3D color. Okay, 1 Corinthians 13, 12. Now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I only know in part, but then I will know even as also I am known. So we see here, the church is partly blind, all right? And so are the Jews. But this hit me like a ton of bricks. Let me think of something. Okay, how many of you knew uh, no, John Wayne. My question is, did John Wayne know you? Okay. How many of you may know some prince? We may know the prince, but is he going to invite you to his wedding? He doesn't know you. A lot of us say we know God, but that's not the question. The question is, does he know you? I mean, this is really something heavy to think about. It says, I know even as also I am known. Look at Matthew 7, 22 and 23. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? We know you. In your name, we've cast out devils. We know you. And in your name, we've done many wonderful works. We know you. And Yeshua says, I'm going to proclaim to you. I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Wow, these people think they know God, but they don't know God. It's one thing to know he exists. It's another thing to have a relationship. That's what Noah's always about. You know, Adam knew his wife. He didn't just know he, she existed. It's a relationship. And so we have to realize the big question is not whether you know God. It's have you made enough difference using what he's given you so that he recognizes and knows you to invite you to the wedding. Let that sink in for a little bit. A lot of people say, well, I know God. How <laughs> does he know you? That, that's a heavy. Look at Isaiah 42, 19 through 21. Who is blind but my servant? Or who is as deaf as my messenger that I sent? Can you imagine? Does God want to send the blind and the deaf to be a messenger? Who is blind is he that is perfect? And blind is the Lord's servant, seeing many things, he says, but you don't pay attention, you don't observe. Opening the ears, but he doesn't hear. The Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake, and he will magnify the law and make it honorable again. Wow. We see, but we don't observe. We hear, but we don't listen. How often do we tell our kids to dump the trash, our teenager? I heard you. Oh, I heard you. I don't want you to hear me. I want you to do it. And that's what the word Shema means, hear and do, hear and obey. Look at Luke 24, 15 and 16, speaking of blindness. It happened while they talked and questioned together that Yeshua himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And this was his own disciples. God blinded Isaac's eyes to accomplish his purposes in bringing forth the Messiah through Jacob. Had Isaac not been blinded and could plainly recognize Esau, the redemption process would have taken a completely different turn. 
So if Israel also, or Jacob, had not been blinded, what would have happened to the redemption of the Gentiles? God has meanings for everything. Let's look at Genesis 27, 2 through 4. Here, Isaac is going to bless Jacob and Esau. And he says, I don't know the day of my death. Now, therefore, he says, I pray thee, uh, your weapons and your quiver and your bow and go out to the field. He tells Esau, and take me some venison, make me savory food such as I love and bring it to me that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. Okay. Now, first off, Isaac thinks he's about to die. But did you know he lives another 43 years? Pretty crazy. Look at this. Now, okay, those of you that are somewhat new, remember that Jacob marries Leah and Rachel, and then he works for six years for the cattle and the livestock, and then he leaves, and then he has to wrestle with an angel. How old was Jacob when he wrestled this angel and won? Any guesses? I will show you. All right, here... Isaac thinks he's going to die. And so he blesses Jacob over Esau. They're now 77 years old. And then what happens? Jacob goes and works for seven years to marry Leah. He's 84. Then he works seven years for Rachel. And he's 91. Then he works six years for the livestock. Wrestles the angel when he's 97 years old. Most people don't put the timeline together. He was almost 100 years old when he's out there wrestling the angel. Joseph is six years old. We have our own imagination of how we think, we think things went. But until you the timeline, you don't realize how old they actually were. Okay, so let's go to the last. I can't believe it. I'm not. I may actually get this done. Okay. Genesis 27, 5 through 10. Rebekah hears when Isaac spoke to Esau, his son. I can't help but think, well, Rebekah says, he's your son. <laughs> Jacob is my son. And it says, uh, he went to the field to hunt for venison and to bring it. And Rebekah spoke to Jacob, her son. Not Neither one of them are their son. It's his son and her son. And he said, Behold, I heard your father speak to Esau, saying, Bring me some venison, make me food that I may eat, and bless you before uh, the Lord before my death. Now, therefore, my son, hearken to my voice according to what I command you. Go now to the flock. Fetch me from there two good kids of the goats. I will make them savory food for your father, such as he loves, and you will bring it to your father that he may eat, so that he may bless you before his death. Now, you got to realize he didn't steal the blessing. He had already bought it. He deserved it. Okay, so let's look at Genesis 27, 15. Rebekah took goodly raiment of her eldest son Esau. Again, it never says firstborn which were with her in the house and put them on Jacob, her younger son. Now, this may be mind-blowing as well, but according to Jewish writings, Rebekah and Jacob carried out their plan to deceive Isaac, whose eyes were dimmed on Passover. And it is on Passover they did recognize Yeshua as their Messiah because their eyes were dimmed. Now, Genesis 27, 19, Jacob says to his father, this is Jacob speaking, I'm Esau, your firstborn. Notice he doesn't say son or eldest son. He says firstborn. In other words, he's, he's Jacob's deserved the firstborn rights. He says, I've done according as you told me, uh, sit down, eat of my venison that your soul may bless me. Now look at the blessing in Genesis 27, 27 through 29. He came near, kissed him, and he smelled the smell of his raiment and blessed him and said, see, the smell of my son is as the smell of the field which the Lord has blessed. Therefore, God give you of the what? Do you know the dew of heaven always refers to the resurrection of the dead? Always refers to the resurrection of the dead. And I will show you that. Um, but anyway, uh, it says, and he will give the fatness of the earth, plenty of corn and wine. Let people serve you. Nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers. It's kind of interesting. You only had one other one. Um, and then it says, let your mother's sons bow down to you. Curse be everyone that curses you. And blessed be he that blesses you. 
As a matter of fact, look at this. In Hebrews 11:20, it says, by faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and, and Esau concerning what? This blessing concerns the future, the end days. When you read this blessing, you have to look at it in terms of what's to come. Look at Isaiah 26, 19. Your dead men will live together with my dead body. Will they arise awake and sing you that dwell in the dust for your dew is as the dew of herbs and the earth will cast out the dead. The word dew all throughout the Tanakh or the Old Testament always refers to the resurrection of the dead. Now Esau comes in Genesis 27, 32 through 34. Isaac, his father said to him, who are you? And he said, I am your son, your firstborn Esau. And Isaac trembled very exceedingly. And he said, well, then who is he that has taken venison and brought it to me? I've eaten all before you even came. And I've even blessed him. Yes, and he will be blessed. And when Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with an exceedingly great and bitter cry. And he said to his father, bless me, bless me. And he's 77 years old. And he's just a whining away. Amazing. Well, if you thought this was amazing, hold on till the next service. Let's stand. We're going to have like a 15-minute break, 15 minutes of worship, and then I'll be back. Avinu Mokenu, our Father, our King, we just thank you so much that we can learn so much. Your Torah is still alive today. We can still learn from it today. So, Father, I just want to thank you right now for all of those bright, shining lights that are right here in this building, that are all over the United States and all over the world as we all come together to worship you, to acknowledge you. We are in the time of great battles. And Father, we just want to thank you that you love us so much, that you want to bless us. And Father, I thank you for all those who bring donations or tithes and offerings into this ministry of yours. It's not ours. Everything is yours. Everything we do is yours. And we just want to use it to glorify you because time is so short and you truly are the light of the world. In Yeshua's name, amen. Together, blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit. Through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua, you alone have planted among us a life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Take a break. Amen and amen. Okay. I have less time uh, the second half because I got to cut it 15 minutes short because we're going to have some entertainment with our little kids, which is fantastic. Uh, so for now, let me get this ready to rock and roll. Try to keep up with me. Oh, uh, one more thing I, I want to announce. As you know, Thanksgiving is this coming Thursday, I believe it is, right? Well, uh, we would like to bless people that have a financial need so you can have a good Thanksgiving. So uh, if you come to me after the service or at the break, uh, we have a gift card we want to give those uh, people that could really use a gift card to make life a little better this Thanksgiving. All right? Okay, so here we are. I got to go fast. Exodus 17, 16. For he said, because the Lord has sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. That means in every generation, there, uh, Amalek is there to destroy the nation of Israel. What I'm going to talk about tonight is how the king is coming, and the question is, are you ready? God says in Genesis 1.14, he's going to use the sun and the moon for signs. Now, look at Psalm 19.1. It says, the heavens, what do they do? They declare the glory of God. The firmament shows his handiwork. How many of you like looking at the stars? I love how many of you know we're not going to see it in Washington? <laughs> but there's a big difference, I have to explain, between biblical astronomy and astrology. Astrology says it's all about you. That's how you know the difference. Guess what? It's not about you. If you focus on what the Bible says and you keep it focused on the glory of God, you won't fall into the air of astrology. We want nothing to do with astrology, but we want everything to do with biblical 
astronomy because God himself said in Genesis 1.14, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for what? Signs. That's the number one reason for signs. But if you don't know how to read the sign, what good does it do? That's why you have to know the times and the seasons. These are signs that cannot be manipulated by false prophets. That's why God uses the, these kinds of signs. These are signs that are understood by every tribe, nation, language, and tongue. And so he said, not only let them be for signs, but for seasons, days, and years. And people make the mistake of thinking that means winter, spring, summer, fall, and the year 1917. No. These uh, the Hebrew word for seasons is moed, and that means divine appointments. So God created the sun and the moon, so they work together in tandem. For, so when they fall on a biblical holiday, we know, wow, this is a sign to pay attention to. When it says days, it refers to holy days, like the Shabbat. When it says years, it's referring to the Shemitah year cycle, the Jubilee cycle. Now, for those... Uh, that want to see a New Testament verse, get a load of this, Luke 21, 25. There will be signs, <laughs> okay? There will be signs, and where are the signs going to be? In the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth, the stress of nations with perplexity. All right, so there will be signs, which refers to eclipses. That's what the sun and the moon working in tandem on the calendar is for. And the nice thing about the sun and the moon, they don't disobey. <laughs> They're not a prophet that's going to disobey. I don't want to go that way. Okay, Psalm 89, 36, 37 says, David's seed will endure forever. His throne as the sun before me, it will be established forever as the moon, as they are the faithful witnesses in heaven. They are God's faithful witnesses. As a matter of fact, uh, in, I have it wrong as Genesis 14, 1, but before that other verse, it's supposed to be Genesis 1, 14, but it's the MBV version. That's the Mark Biltz version. <laughs> Here's how it should actually read. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven, divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs, for the divine appointments, for the Sabbath days, for the marking of the Shemitah and Jubilee years. Now, that's where people could understand. Okay. Now, here we go. How, I haven't even heard about the sign in the heavens when he was born. Exactly. So I'm going to go through some charts here real quick. Uh, the ones you want me to make handouts of, I will let Jomi know. Okay, we're going to go run. I love math. I love science. I love facts. I love scripture. So NASA... They know all the eclipses for over 5,000 years, from 2000 BC to 3000 AD, which hasn't even come yet. They list every eclipse where it will be for 5,000 years. All lunar eclipses, there will be 12,000 lunar eclipses over 5,000 years, of which 4,300 are penumbral, 4,200 are partial, and about 3,500 are total. That means... If there are 3,500 total eclipses lunar and there's 12,000 total, you only average one total lunar eclipse every year and a half. Does everyone get that? See, that's close to 25%. And 4,000 is about 25% of, you know, 5,000 or 12,000. Okay, so solar eclipses. You also only average one total solar eclipse every year and a half. So it's real easy to remember. Over 5,000 years, there's been roughly 12,000 solar, 12,000 lunar, of which only 3,500 are total lunar eclipses, and 3,173 are total solar eclipses. Everyone got that? Okay. Here's what happened to me in 2008. That's what, 15 years ago. I was in my prayer closet. My prayer closet was actually our walk-in closet. That was the only closet that we had for me to pray in. It was, I've been praying forever, and it was like 4 in the morning, and I got up, and I got my prayer closet, and I started praying, and all of a sudden, I received this download. 
And God told me to go compare what I see with NASA. So I went to NASA. How many total lunar eclipses do you get every year and a half? One. I went to NASA's website, and I saw there were four total lunar eclipses in a row within a year and a half. What are the odds? Four total lunar eclipses in a row. April of 2014, April 15th, October 8th, 2015, April 4th, and September 28th. Okay, this is in 2008, which was a Shemitah year. And this, 2014, 2015, is a Shemitah year. It was exactly in a Shemitah year. I saw seven years later in a Shemitah year, there are going to be the four total lunar eclipses. Now, what is the first thing you should ask yourself? Where do these fall on the biblical calendar? God doesn't use the Gregorian calendar. So I looked. Oh, my goodness. On April 15th, it fell on Passover. Oh, my gosh. The next one fell on Sukkot. And the next one fell on Passover. And the next one fell on Sukkot. Okay, now, wait a minute. If God's the one who controls all the eclipses, and the average is one every year and a half, and I get four in a year and a half, and they're all in a row, and they fall on the, the holidays, okay? Here's what I came, I hear, I, I have all, not only that, there were solar eclipses. And the total solar eclipse fell on Nisan 1, the beginning of the religious calendar. And the next one fell on Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of the civil calendar. Now, when you think God is trying to say something, okay? So, I'm looking at that and I go, oh my goodness, this is God speaking when was the last time we had four blood moons in a row? Guess when it was? 1967, when Israel captured Jerusalem. And I'm going, oh my goodness, when did it happen before that? When Israel became a nation. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, when did it happen next? 1492, when all the Jews were kicked out of Spain on the 9th of Av. And I'm just kind of jumping out of my skin. And I go, my goodness, what are the odds? So we go to Vegas to find out. And the question is, what are the odds when you only have one total lunar eclipse every year and a half to have four in a year and a half, to have all four of them in a row with none of the others in between, all four fall on Passover and Sukkot, significant events happen to the Jewish people, and it's repeated event throughout history. I can't control eclipses. It's not me. I'm just saying the facts. What about solar eclipses? As I'm going back, guess what? Solar eclipses. Now, if you remember, you only get one every year and a half. This is when the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. You go to NASA's website. You have solar and lunar eclipses on Sukkot, Nisan 1, Passover, Rosh Hashanah, Sukkot. Purim, Nisan 1, Rosh Hashanah. That's when they occur. And oh my gosh, you're having solar lunar eclipses on top of each other. But guess what? There's more. Look at the hybrid solar eclipses on the bottom. See that? Look at the, what I have here. How rare are hybrid solar eclipses? Of the 12,000 solar eclipses, there's only been 569 hybrid, which means they only happen once every 10 years. And here I have two within six months that fall on Nisan 1 and Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of the religious calendar and the beginning of the civil calendar. So I'm thinking, hmm, God's using signs in the heavens on his holidays to give us signs. Does that make sense? Am I, am I jumping any logic? Okay, I just wanted to give you the history from back in 2008 is when God gave me this. And I didn't know what it meant really. And so I wrote that book on the blood moons and everybody was writing books on my material and all coming up with things. And the publisher said, said Bill, why don't you write it? You don't want to came up with it. Well, I never wrote a book before. Well, just give me 50,000 words and we'll write it. Okay. So that's how it happened. Not because I'm any great author. Okay, so here we go. I took the Jubilee cycle we just ended the last 50 years, and here the Jubilee always begins on Yom Kippur. On Shabbat, it was the Shabbat, October 6th of 73, 
the very first day the year of Jubilee is proclaimed, we have the Yom Kippur War. The very first day of the Jubilee. And then what do we have? It goes from October 6th to October 7th, but 50 years later, on the Shabbat, the very last day, known as Shemini Yetzirah, Simchat Torah, we have a war. So the Jubilee literally began on the first day with a war and the last day with a war. So it's like parentheses around this. Now again, it was 2008, a Shemini year, on a Shabbat, when I first spoke about the blood moons, it was the 15th of Av when I taught this. And guess what? The 2014-2015 blood moons that I was looking at was exactly seven years, a Shemitah cycle, before the end of the Jubilee. And before this, I noticed in 1967, we had a war, but it also was exactly seven years before the next Jubilee. So what were the blood moons saying? They're saying at the very beginning in 67, seven more years, the beginning of the year of Jubilee, there's going to be a war. And then in 2014, 2015, exactly a Shemitah cycle before the end of the Jubilee is a war. Okay? Here, what are the odds that you have these four blood moons occur seven years before the beginning and seven years before the end of a Jubilee cycle and with wars? So here are you. You are right here. This is the end of the Jubilee cycle. This is the first year of seven years. Each one of these are seven years. Seven times seven is 49. We are right here, and we're trying to figure out what this Jubilee cycle is going to bring. Here it ended with the Iron Sword War, which is going right now. 24, 2015 sign. Okay, so here we go. The seventh millennial day begins. And how do we know? It is because it begins at sunset. And the sun is setting. We're in the end of the sixth day. So with that said, I want to talk about solar lunar eclipses. I'm going to talk about these more next week. But let me begin here. How many total solar eclipses have been over the United States since we became a nation in 1776? Right? Guess what? Eight. There's only been eight total solar eclipses since we became a nation. The first two were in the 1700s. The next 80 years later, we had three in the 1800s. 92 years later, we had two in the 1900s, and now we're in the 2000s. And 38 years after that, we have August 21st of 2017, seven years ago, We had the Great American Eclipse that went across the United States from Oregon through the Carolinas. I want to tell you about this particular eclipse, which is so significant, which is exactly seven years before the next one coming next April, and that is this. Now, many of you may know, but when it comes to uh, eclipses, the solar eclipse is bigger than a lunar eclipse. The sun's bigger than the moon. And so it is said that solar eclipses refer to judgment coming upon the nations. A lunar eclipse means God's coming to judge Israel. This eclipse in 2017 that went diagonally clear across the United States was the very first total solar eclipse exclusive to the United States since we became a nation in 1776. Of all of those, this one which means this specifically is judgment for the United States. It didn't go through Mexico. It didn't go through Canada. This is something coming on the United States. Okay, so let's go back and let's take a look at these. If you look at the top right, June 24, 1778. Oh, first, April 8th of this next year, guess when that falls? Nissan 1. Okay, beginning of the religious calendar. Well, what happens, or what happened in the 1700s during that time frame? The Revolutionary War. What happened in the 1860s? The Civil War. What happens in the 70s? The Vietnam War. Are you getting a hint? August 21st, 2017, that first one that came across was a warning because we, I believe, are going to very likely see war next spring that's going to be in the United States. Could be terrorism. I don't know what. But this is the pattern I'm seeing. The next solar eclipse over the United States isn't until 2044. Also, 
nine is the last of the digits and thus marks the end. It's significant of the conclusion of a matter it is the number of finality or judgment. So 2017 was the eighth one. This one coming up is the ninth one. Now here's something I need to point out also. Look at numbers one. Numbers one, one through three, they're getting ready to go to war. And the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness, on the, uh, in the tabernacle of the congregation, on the first day of the second month. When you hear first day of a month, what should you think of? A new moon. The first is always on the new moon. The 15th is always on the full moon. You can only have a solar eclipse on a new moon. You can only have a lunar eclipse on a full moon. And it says, oh, by the way, when's the second month? What month is the second month? That's exactly right. The second month is ER. And they're going to war in the second month. The second month is March on our calendar. All right. The first day of the second month, in the second year, after they were come out of Egypt, saying, take the sum of all the congregation of the children of Israel from 20 years old and upward, all that are able to go where? To war and number them by their armies. Well, guess what? ER... Are we supposed to know the times and seasons? Then we need to know what each Hebrew month means. What is ER known for? War. That's why the Bible, the very first day of the second month, they're saying get ready for war. So here are the tribes as they were around the tabernacle, east, south, west, and north. Numbers 10 It goes with Numbers 1, and it's when they're ready to go to war for the promised land. They end up being afraid of the giants and all kinds of problems, but it was the month of war when they were headed out. Now, if you'll notice, I have in black the numbers uh, all the way around, and that's how the order they went in their armies. The east side went first, then the south, then the west, then the north. Well, there's 12 tribes, and there's 12 months, so each tribe was assigned a month based on how they traveled. Okay, so Judah goes first, so they're the first month, Nisan. And you go all the way around to the number six, that is the month of Elul, which is right before Tishri, which is Rosh Hashanah, Feast of Yom Kippur, Feast of Sukkot. Everyone following? Okay, the thing about it, well, then comes Tishri, which is the first of the civil calendar, and then the last over there is Adar, which is the 12th month. Well, here's the thing. When you think about it, from the east and the south, we're all Leah's kids. The tribes are separated, so there's no fighting. They have Leah's kids, and then Gad is Zilpah, Leah's handmaid's kid. And so the baton, as it's going through as they travel, gets all the way over to Gad, the first six. Then he passes it to Ephraim, and Ephraim and Manasseh and Benjamin are all Rachel's kids. And then it goes over to Naphtali, who was Bilha, Rachel's handmaid's kid. And so it just goes around and around. Naphtali hands it over back to Judah. So we, uh, what I want you to remember is Judah is first and Gad is last when it comes to Leah's kids. And then Ephraim goes first and then Naphtali goes last. Everyone see that? Well, let me see if I've been skipping. Okay, look at Numbers 10, 9. It says, when you do what? Go to war in your land against the adversary that oppresses you, then you shall sound an alarm with the shofar. That's why I had the shofar guy blowing on the new moon, because he also blew on the new moon. It also blew because it's time to go to war. All right, and it says, uh, you'll be remembered when you sound the alarm by the Lord, and you'll be safe from your enemies. So now we get the marching orders of how they marched, and it's according to the tribes. Numbers 10, 14 through 16, who goes first? The children of Judah, and over the host of the tribe of the children of Issachar, and over the host of the tribe of Zebulun. So all those three were on the west, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun. That is the order order of how they went. And then look at Numbers 2, going back to them, because 1 and 2 go with 10 and 11. 
The children of Israel are to put up their tents in the order of their families by the what? Flags of their father's houses facing the tent. Those who tents who are on the east looking to the dawn will be around the flag of Judah. So here I put the flags. So Judah goes to Gad, goes to Ephraim, goes to Naphtali. Now Judah to Ephraim, that's Leah to Rachel, and they fall on Passover and Rosh Hashanah. Okay, now watch this. <sighs> Let's see. I think this is amazing here. Okay. Exodus 17, 15, and 16. And Moses built an altar. This is after the war with Amalek. And it says, he called the name of it Jehovah Nisi, which means what? The Lord is my flag. The Lord is my banner. So here they all have banners for each tribe. And that's when it says the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. All right. So the banners have to do with warring against Amalek. Now, if you go to Numbers 2, 9, it says, let all the armies of Judah go first. And then Numbers 2, all the armies of Reuben. And Numbers 2, 24, all the armies of Ephraim. And Numbers 2, 31, all of the armies of the tents of Dan. And they will go forward last by their flags. So it gives you the number of the armies. And Reuben, since they're the head, it gives you all three of the tribes as one big amount. Same thing with the east. It, went, it says Judah, and then Reuben, and then Ephraim. Okay, but the reason why is because they're the leaders of all the tribes on their side. And then in Numbers 2.34, it says, So the children of Israel did as the Lord said to Moses. They put up their tents by their flags, and they went forward in the same order. Okay, so they're marching in the same order as they go. And each month is attributed to that tribe, which is why... We have a whole series where I talk about the importance of each month and each tribe. Uh, I'm, hopefully, I can get a book done before too long that tells you the importance of each month so you know the times and the seasons. But look at Song of Songs, chapter 6, verse 10. Here, it's speaking of the bride, and the daughters of Jerusalem say, Who is she that looks forth as the morning? Fair as the moon, clear as the sun, terrible as an army with what? Banners. But wait, there's more. Then look what happens. She says, return, return, as if they're gone. The knots all. The rapture. Whatever you want to talk about, they're gone. And look what it says. Return, return, O Shulamite, return, return, that we may look upon you. What will you see in this Shulamite, she says? As it were, the company of what? Two armies, the heavenly one and the earthly one, working together. All right. Now, let's look at 2 Samuel 5, 22 through 25. Oh, my gosh, I'm in so much trouble. Uh, we may have to push some of this off till next week. Okay, 2 Samuel 5, we'll just do what we can. 22 through 25. And the Philistines, where do the Philistines live? Gaza Strip came up again and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. And when David inquired of the Lord, he said, you shall not go up, but fetch a compass behind them and come upon them over against what kind of trees? Mulberry trees. And let it be when you hear the sound of a going in the tops of the mulberry trees, that then you will bestir yourself. For then will the Lord go out before you to smite the host of the Philistines. And David uh, did as the Lord commanded and smote the Philistines. Okay, so what do we see? There are two armies. There's the spiritual army that is racing across the top of the mulberry trees, and there's the earthly army. Well, guess what? In Israel, the mulberry trees are ripe in March and April. This is springtime that this event happened. Now, Daniel 10, 1, three minutes? Okay. Daniel 10, 1, it says, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, which is Iran, a word was revealed to Daniel, and the word was true, even one of what? Great warfare, and he gave heed to the word because he had understanding of the vision. All right. So here are these mulberry trees, which is in the spring. Now Daniel is having a vision while he's living in Persia or Iran. 
And Daniel 10, 2 and 3. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning how many weeks? Three weeks. And then he says, I didn't anoint myself for three weeks. So here, all of a sudden, in Daniel 10, 4 and 5, on the 24th day of the first month, what's the first month? Nisan, roughly April, Passover, he says it was from the 24th day he was by the river and he lifted up his eyes. So let me show you this real quick and then we'll end. Okay, this is next year. April 8th is on here. Nisan, 2024. April 8th, we know, is a new moon. All right, then comes the first of Nisan. Daniel's fast began on the 3rd of Nisan, and we just read it was on the 24th of Nisan, which is springtime, that the angelic host appears to him. And it is on the 1st of Nisan that we're going to have this total solar eclipse. That's when the angel wanted to appear to him, but he couldn't because he's going to war with the angel of Iran for 21 days. And then while, the, oh, and of course, this one is Passover when we are also going to have a comet swing by and this battle keeps going. And then he appears and then he says, I have to go now. Okay. And why? Uh, he says in Daniel 10, 20, he's, then he said, do you know why I even came to you? And now I'm going to return to fight with the prince of Persia. There's a spiritual warfare going on. There's an earthly warfare going on. And next week, I'm going to show you what it all means and the signs coming in the heavens. Thank you. We'll do the little skit now, and then I'll close with a priestly blessing.